ready. Everybody's here today. <laughs> Good morning, Messiah. Please stand and sing with us. morning in person and online. Uh, I, I don't usually wear a robe for a 930 service. I, I was a chatty Kathy and I didn't get my robe off in time and I, I stripped down naked in the summer so I don't sweat as bad. So it's not a matter of just pulling it off there. There's stuff you don't want to see. Uh, we, we always begin with our apostolic greeting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Man, let's get to this thing.
Holy Dad, we give thanks this morning for the power of your Holy Spirit that moves us in the midst of worship. May we trust that spirit now and in the week ahead as we carry that spirit forward in your world. Amen. Um, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share God's love, God's peace with one another now. God's peace, Patsy, all by yourself. Uh, I need children to come forward. Children, come on forward. Right. And then you. I'm first. Yes. <laughs> come on down. All right. Oh, look at all these kids coming forward. Oh, I've got a basketball with no air in it right here. So what is this? Basketball! basketball. So today in uh, the sermon, we're going to talk about faith, right? And we believe in the church that we receive faith when we're baptized. When we're baptized, we receive faith. So Penny was just baptized just a little while ago, and, we, and she received faith when she was baptized. And that makes faith sound like a gift, right? Yeah. Zeke, you ready? There you go. So, so faith is given to Zeke, and Zeke has this basketball, right? Yeah. Does that make... But if you get a basketball, do you know how to play basketball? No. No, right? you got to learn. What are the things you got to learn how to do for basketball? Catch it. you got to learn how to catch it, which you're on your way for that one, right? you got to learn how to dribble it, which is hard when it, there's no air, right? you got to learn how to dribble it. What else do you have to learn? Shoot it. Shoot it, right? And you do it all, and you, and you got to do those things how many times? Once, and once you shoot it, then you know how to shoot the basketball? No, you got to do it over and over and over again, right? Those guys that play on TV, they spend hours learning how to shoot the ball. Shooting it over and over again, and dribbling and passing and all those things. So they... So, and faith is like that too. It's not a matter of just giving you the gift of faith. Then you got to spend a lifetime kind of learning how to use that faith. And you do that by practicing. What do you think the ways that you practice faith are? Coming to church, maybe, huh? Yeah. Maybe praying, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe being nice to your neighbors yeah. and being loving. Maybe making pictures for them and drawing for them, huh? Oh, that is very wonderful. I bet Miss Connor loved that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it, it was one of the My Little Pony babies. Which one? It was, it was like the one that has the pink hair. Oh, yeah. I love the one with the pink hair. No? <laughs> Let's say a prayer. You ready? Lord, we give thanks for the faith we've received. Help us practice and use this faith so that your world might be made better. Amen. All right, guys. Thanks. You can go with Laura and Adam, it looks like. Here. Oh, no. I better save that for 11 o'clock. Huh? Uh, we got a special gift. Uh, Sarah's going to bring us special music from our praise band here. start on the outside the outside looking in this is where grace begins 
we were hungry, we were thirsty, with nothing left to give. Oh, the shape that we were in. And just when our hope seemed lost, the love opened the door for us. He said, come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Come meet this motley crew of misfits. These liars and these thieves, there's no one unwelcome here. And that sin and shame that you brought with you, you can leave it at the door and let mercy draw you near. So come to the table, come join the sinners who are there. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Come to the table. To the thief and to the doubter. To the hero and the coward, to the prisoner and the soldier, to the young and to the older, all who hunger, all who thirst, all the last and all the first, all the paupers and the princes, all who failed, you've been forgiven, all the dream and all who suffer, all who love and lost another, all the chained and all the free, all who follow, all who lead, anyone who's been let down, all the lost you have been found, all who've been labeled right or wrong, to everyone who hears this song. He said, come to the table, come join the sinners, you have been redeemed, take your place, beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Oh, sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Come to the table. Sit down and be Set free, come to the table. Where have our scripture read? Holly, are you reading scripture? Good morning. Today's reading is from Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. 
hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. <coughs> Thanks be to God. Please stand as we welcome our gospel. St. Matthew, the ninth chapter. So as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew, and he was sitting at a tax booth. And Jesus said to him, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed Jesus. <clears throat> and as Jesus sat at dinner in Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners, they came and they were sitting with him and all the disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to Jesus' disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician. Physician. <laughs> Take trouble all day with that word. But those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. So while Jesus was saying all these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came and knelt before Jesus and said, My daughter has just died. Come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with all of his disciples. And suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up from behind and touched the fringe of Jesus' cloak. For she said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and saw her and said, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players in the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at Jesus. But when the crowd had been put up outside, he went in and he took her by the hand. And the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise <clears throat> you may be seated. So every month, September to May, uh, Family Minister Adam and I, uh, we do a, a chapel service in here for our school. Our three, four, and five-year-olds on Wednesdays. Uh, second Wednesday, something like that. We do that. And, we, and in uh, Resurrection time, Easter, uh, we, I have done the same chapel children's sermon uh, for maybe 10, 15 years. 
Um, because, you know, they're kids and they grow up and then they're new kids, so no one knows I'm doing the same one over and over again. And, and the one I do is, uh, is uh, we start over here by looking at this uh, stained glass window right there, the, the butterfly window. If you've never noticed our windows before, each one tells a different story of the Bible. Um, and uh, starting with that tree over there with the fruit on there, which you would guess would be the Genesis tree of life and, and going around. And that's, and that's the resurrection window. Uh, and butterfly is a symbol of the resurrection, right? And that's why our in-house artist, Lois Berry, painted a beautiful butterfly on our welcome center windows uh, this uh, season for Easter. Uh, a butterfly escaping a dead and dying chrysalis uh, that's hanging on a tree. A symbol of Jesus escaping the tomb and, and, and finding new life uh, uh, changed in the resurrection. A butterfly. So in order to teach about a butterfly to three, four, and five-year-olds, we, we, we go through the motions of starting as a caterpillar, right? So I have all of them, including myself, we get on our bellies and we, we start, you know, moving around like a caterpillar might, moving around on the floor. And, and I talk about how cool caterpillars are because they're because, you know, they're, they're kind of furry and they're fun to hold and they got all these cool little feet and caterpillars are fun and, and all they do all day is eat, I tell them, and, they, and then we all make chomping sounds while we're laying on our bellies, chomp, 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 because they eat, they just have a voracious appetite and they eat so many leaves that they get tired, because that's what happens after you eat too much, you get tired. And they just want to curl up, but they got to make their own bed. So we make our own chrysalis and then we curl up into that chrysalis and we fall sound asleep. So all these three, four, and five-year-olds are making snoring sounds now, right? And I said, and while they're asleep, the rest of the world thinks that they're dead because this chrysalis is dry and it's just hanging from a tree. But then that caterpillar wakes up and, and something's changed about it. And I, and I have them go like this and, and they, they got wings and, and they poke those wings out of the chrysalis and and then they let them dry in the sun and the sun gives them power that suddenly they can do something they could never do before as a caterpillar. They can fly. And they're this beautiful animal that flies around. And I say there, there's still a caterpillar somewhere inside of them, but they've been changed in that sleep. And God has given them now these new and greater gifts. The resurrection. And everyone leaves happy. Right? And, 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 and I always struggle a, a, a little bit at the end of the story because, um, <clears throat> because it feels kind of like a once and done sort of thing, right? I mean, we all know what falling asleep means. That, you know, that I don't go into that with the three, four, and five-year-olds. But we know what that means. And, and, and so, so it, it makes faith in what we're doing here seem like something that we're just waiting around till we die before we experience the joy of this resurrection. You know, that we spend our lives as a caterpillar and never really get to be a butterfly. And, and, and I know one sermon isn't all the sermons, right? So, we, so if you would have came at Pentecost, you would have heard a, 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 a moving sermon and, and a moving service about the Holy Spirit that lifts us up right now and changes us and gives us gifts so that we can be part of the world in a way that is different and transformative, not just for us, but for everyone around us. And, and you might have even been moved by that. Um, service on Memorial Weekend where we had 10 people come to it on that day. You might have been one of those 10 that went away saying, hallelujah. But then you go home, right? And, and, and you get weighted down by, by the weight of the world, by your mistakes, by other people's mistakes. And, and it starts to feel like you're a caterpillar again, pushed down all the way to the ground rather than a butterfly that's fluttering in the sky. So Abraham. A Abraham is, is a really main character in the Old Testament, okay? Uh, <clears throat> in the first book of Genesis, all sorts of stories are told by Abraham, but they begin with this primary story that when he was an older man in his late 80s, early 90s, 
uh, and a wealthy man, God comes to him and says, Abraham, I am going to give you a son. Something he had not had at that point, even though he had accumulated all this wealth and stuff. I'm going to give you a son in your old age, and it's going to be through your wife, who's equally as old as you are. If you trust this promise, that son will lead to generations that will fill the skies with people. More than the stars you could see. If you trust this promise, then get up and go. And Abraham trusted the promise, this unbelievable, remarkable promise that, that he, in his old age, way past baby-making age for both him and Sarah, that God would make a baby. And, 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 and God did make a baby for them, a, a, a boy named Isaac. And, and so you have this vision of Abraham saying yes and kind of fluttering away like a butterfly to, to live this faithful life. But if you read all those Genesis stories, Abraham spends most of his life way down here in the bottom, rolling around in, in a midst of bad decisions and, and not trusting God and, and hurting people around him by his selfishness. This man who now is lifted up in Judaism, in Islam, and in Christianity, as the epitome of faith. That's why Paul uses him in this Romans letter to talk about faithfulness. This man who is so faithful, and that that's the sort of faith we need to emulate, spent his life of faith having the same amount, if not even more problems, than we do today. And so it makes you wonder, you know what? If Abraham is the epitome of faith, if he's the center of faith, what, what does that mean about faith overall? Is there a different way for us to look at this thing? And so when we were studying Romans in this text, we, came, or we were using a, a scholar named N.T. Wright. And, and N.T. Wright, when he was talking about this fourth chapter in Romans, he said, you know, I look at faith this way. And let me try this out on you. He said, I look at faith as, as being brought to a window and seeing a whole new world outside that window. And it's a world that looks like our world, but it just seems to be running better. A, a world where, where, where people are, are caring for one another. They're concerned for one another. They're not gathering and, and, and uh, trying to hoard their sharing so that there's an abundance. They're treating people with dignity and honor and respect regardless of their race or their gender or their nationality. They're taking seriously their responsibilities to the creation, to the care for the plants and the trees and the animals. You can look out that window and you go, yeah. That's what this world is supposed to look like. And that world is bathed in a sunshine that warms you and encourages you as you stand near the window. And he said, that's what faith is, to see this vision. But in our lives, as we move away from that window, even turn our back from that window, we move into the darker parts of our world and, and, and we forget this goodness that we've seen. And we can't feel the, the warmth and the heat of that light. And our lives become smaller, meaner, selfish. But even when we're in the darkest corners with the, with the largest weights of the world upon us and the greatest shame for what we've done, we just simply need to turn and look back at that window. And move closer to it again to be hopeful for what the world could be and what we could be in it. And that was Wright's vision of faith. You know, a, a, a moment a, a, of seeing what kind of a butterfly life looks like. Crawling around in the darkness and then coming back to that butterfly life again. <clears throat> so in the 1980s. I think it was sometime right after I graduated from college, a friend of ours who went through a lot of boyfriends in her 20s 
um, was going through this one guy that was like 10 years older than her, so it was a little weird, but he was a really good looking guy. She was a really good looking uh, young lady too, but this guy was like, you know, like magazine good looking, you know, with muscles and, and stuff like that. And, uh, and, and uh, but it was a little weird because he was a little older and also he was a college graduate, but he had this really rote sort of job that was, you know, worse than anybody else's job. And, and so we couldn't quite put it all together, who this guy was and why he was hanging around. And, and we didn't have the Google back in those days, you know, where we could just, you know, stalk them or something to figure out who they are or where they came from. We, we had to do it the old-fashioned way. We had to get out a phone and dial it and, you know, call up people and ask, hey, do you know this guy? And, and we, one of us did all that, not me. One of us did all that, and we found out that this guy had been in jail for two years, prison. And, 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 and this person then, like, confronted him in the midst of, like, a gathering with other people around. What's this about that I heard? And, and he got really anxious, and, as you could imagine, being confronted like that. And he, and, and he told us that he had drank too much one night, and he, and he uh, got on an exit in Toledo and, uh, the wrong way and, and, and hit somebody head on and killed a, a 40-year-old woman with uh, two children, I think is the story. And he went to jail for that, prison, for two years. And, well, then it was awkward, right, at that point. And, and, and this girl, she'd gone through so many boyfriends that she, she dumped him shortly after that, I think. And, and I never really thought much more of that other than being, you know, horrified by the story as you are. Until maybe a year after that or so, I, I was teaching at Central Catholic High School in Toledo. And Mothers Against Drunk Driving were doing, was doing an assembly like they did a lot in the 80s. And, 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 and he was the featured speaker at the assembly. And so with my high school kids, you know, I'm sitting on those bleachers that, uh, and, and, and I heard this story more completely. And the story was a story of someone who started drinking heavily in college and didn't stop afterwards. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday would get blitzed and, 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 and drive home. And this horrible night could have happened on any of those nights, he said in that story. And one night he made that horrific mistake and he, and he took somebody's life. And he said he's tried to reach out to the family since then and they understandably want nothing to do with him. And the only thing he can do to, to make amends is, is, is to live a different sort of life now. A life sober, he told him, and a life sharing this story that he's ashamed of with others so that they might think twice before they make these same mistakes and live with that burden. And it was a really powerful story. And it reminds me today, it came to my head as I was thinking, that's what life looks like for us at times, doesn't it? Where, where we understand what God hopes and wants for us, and, and, and we are close to that window, and we can see the best version of Carl outside that window. The butterfly that's inside. And then we turn, and we do selfish and mean things that break us and that break our world. In the midst of darkness, our, our, our low caterpillar sort of roly-poly days. But it, it just takes us turning around and even the greatest shame can't heal what's broken. But it can bring us back to life and bring life to others. If we just move close. So I, I guess I just want to say, for all the caterpillars in here today that, that, that feel weighted down by the stuff and the crap and the, and the brokenness that you are about or this world has been about and put upon you, know that it just takes moving closer to that light. Trusting the promise, like Abraham said, that remarkable things can happen. And learning again how to fly. Amen.
the source of all life and the ground of our being. By the power of your spirit, heal each of us, Lord, so that we might be the butterflies that you see in the midst of our caterpillar existence. I pray for everyone here this morning that they might be able to lift up their shame and their brokenness and leave it behind. Move closer to your light and to your love and to your hope for them and the creation. Pray for all those places that are broken in our world, places like in a war, like in the Ukraine, places where global warming is causing huge changes, like the islands in the South Pacific. Pray for those who are sick or ill in our midst. I pray for Tiffany's family and their grief at her sudden loss. Kimberly, Susan, Jennifer, Sherry, Karen, Teresa, Mary, Ziva, Sam, Jim, Ann, and others named aloud now.
And Lord, we lift up celebrations too this morning. Places where your spirit and your love have been made known. We celebrate with Taylor and Christina at the start of their married life together last night. We pray a celebration for Sherry and Tim and their anniversary that's coming this week. We pray a celebration for Ryan that he is cancer free. Hear all these prayers, Lord. May your presence and spirit be known in the midst of them. Help us gather as your body in this space and trust your spirit so that we might share this vision of resurrection that we have all received in the waters of our baptism. Help us trust the promise as Abraham trusted the promise of your presence and remarkable things to be done. Like in this wine and bread coming to us in a good and mysterious way. We trust today the promise that Jesus made in the night he was betrayed, where he took bread and broke it and gave thanks and gave it to all his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a sign of the new covenant shed in my blood for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread, drink this wine, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Transform us so that we might be resurrection people, shunning death forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. seated. We'll commune our uh, friends at home with these communion kits. If you run out of these communion kits and you can't get to the church, please just call us. We'll get them to you. And those who are communing in their seats here with us with these kits. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. <laughs> Amen. Uh, we have visitors today. Please know you're welcome to commune with us. This is God's table, not Messiah's table or Lutheran table. And you are a child of God, so come and eat. Uh, everyone's invited here.
and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in his grace. Amen. Lord, fed and nourished at your table, may we be your people now and forever. Amen. Uh, just a few announcements before we scatter. The Amy Cannon uh, is going to be out there at the sign-up lectors. Uh, if you want to be a lector and uh, do a, a, a wonderful job as Holly did today, if if Holly set the bar too high and you said, oh, I could never do that good, don't worry. Your gift will still be celebrated. So sign up to be a lector and uh, come and give that good gift. Uh, Ian uh, Fuller, uh, uh, an active high school youth uh, here at Messiah and all sorts of uh, activities and service in our church. Uh, he's going for his Eagle Scout and there's something in the bulletin board about a fundraiser that he's having tomorrow. We apologize that we didn't get this in earlier than that. But it's at Jimmy V's, uh, a Pataskala uh, uh, restaurant, and it is a um, Euchre tournament. Uh, and the fundraising, this is why we're talking about it, uh, not only are we excited that he's gonna get his Eagle Scout, but his Eagle Scout project is to build an outdoor chapel uh, near our shelter house here at Messiah. Uh, that he's got designs for, that he drew up, that Fred McClitt, our property chair, and myself and Adam looked at and approved. And so it'll be really cool. So, so that's what he's doing. If you can help, if you got the tomorrow free and you're a Euchre player, go and do that tomorrow. Uh, Hole Again is meeting tomorrow at Barb's house. Uh, if you uh, uh, need more information about that, uh, Barb's here, but, uh, but also you could read that uh, bulletin board announcement. And we got a blood drive coming on June 26th, so two Mondays away. Uh, but there's a QR code, one of those fancy things they got now, that you can uh, sign up for the blood drive with that. 
or you could download the Red Cross app like I have on my phone, or just go to Red Cross, whatever it is, .org, and uh, it's really easy to sign up. But please, um, if you're free that Monday, queue at the church to give, uh, please give blood. We have VBS coming up, uh, which uh, if you know of children that could come, come and get them registered. We sent out some reminder cards. Uh, we've got a good crop of kids so far, but uh, we'd love to have more. And we've got great volunteers that have stepped forward, but I'm sure we could use more too. Uh, and there's also some supplies you could buy to help be a part of it too as you're leaving. That's all I've got. Let's uh, stand and have our blessing before we leave. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you all with favor and grant you God's peace. Amen. Serve the Lord. Thank you, God. Amen.